Joan Quinn Profiles. As an editor for Andy Warhol's interview with the Los Angeles Herald Examiner, LA Style, and Detour Magazines, Joan covered the social set, the Hollywood hotshots, the international art scene, the mysteries of food, the excitement of travel, and the fabulous world of fashion. Joan continues to find creative people on the cutting edge who make things happen. Here's Joan Agajanian Quinn. Hi, I'm Joan Quinn, and welcome to the Joan Quinn Profiles. Waiting to be profiled are cellists Ruslan Buryakov and actress June Gable. Award-winning, renowned cellist Ruslan Buryakov was born and raised in Azerbaijan. He studied at the Baku Academy in Azerbaijan, the Tchaikovsky, uh, Moscow, Conservatory in Russia, and USC's Thornton School of Music in California. He's been a master teacher at music festivals in Russia and Europe, and his teaching positions that he's held have been in Moscow and in Croatia. You've seen him not only with the Glendale Philharmonic Orchestra, which he was a founder, but also on the stage at Frank Gehry's fantastic um, Philharmonic Hall, Disney Hall in downtown Los Angeles. Um, Frank Gehry has built this architectural gem where we hear the most fantastic music in Los Angeles. Did you think that your future would be as a cellist? No. What were you going to do? Well, my mother is a piano player. Yes. So before I was born, it was decided that I'd be exposed to music, obviously, and my mother wanted me to be a piano player. Ah. So since I, you know, I can remember myself, uh, I remember sitting before this huge brown box we had at home, you know, trying to uh, do what, whatever my mother would request me to, and I was probably three or four years old at that time. <laughs> And of course, you know, there was a question, like, I would try to play those fugues and preludes and the mom, why, why do you want me to do it? All the kids are playing outside, you know, and I'm... <laughs> Musicians always say that. They always say, I had to stay inside and the kids were playing outside. Is and it true? Was that happening? Well, pretty much, yes. And <laughs> by the age of seven, I rebelled. <laughs> so I remember the day when my mother said, that's it, I cannot teach him anymore. He has to go to the school. And we lived in Soviet Union. It was Soviet Union at that time. So Azerbaijan and Armenia and all that whole thing was so, so was yeah, Soviet, all, wasn't yeah. it? All fifteen republics were together. Georgia. Yes, yes, and Latvia, Lithuania, Ukraine. Every everybody lived together. We lived in Baku. That was the capital of Azerbaijan. And uh, I remember that they were, you know, the, uh, in Soviet Union, education was for free. And uh, imperative. Yeah. You had however, to do it. However, there was one nuance. Uh, music education was for free only for talented children. How, how did they know how talented you were? Uh, there was an entrance exam in the music school, which I successfully failed. And how old were you? Five years old? <laughs> no, I was seven years old. But seven years old and you failed? It? I, uh, my, I remember that day very well as if it would be yesterday. So my mother was preparing me for that significant moment. <laughs> and apparently I could do everything very well at home, but it was the first, mo first time in my life I was taken away from my mother and I was brought into a pretty big room with two pianos with a dozen of uh, pretty unfriendly people. <laughs> I was scared. I was scared to death. And I remember they asked me to clap in rhythm, you know, to sing something. Uh, and I was just standing without being able to move. I was shocked. Oh. So the verdict was that the child cannot hear very well child doesn't have sense of rhythm. Uh, That's what they test you on those things, the rhythm exactly, and how you, you exactly. proceed with what yes. they've told you. Yeah, so my, I remember when the, they announced um, the result of the test to my mother, she was terrified and very much surprised because she, I remember she was saying, but he could do all these things at home, how is it possible? <laughs> so my parents were offered to pay for my piano lessons and I remember the amount that was 20 rubles a month. And for the comparison, uh, you know, my mother's salary was 100 rubles a month. So it was Did one she work fifth. as a pianist? Yeah, she, 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 was a, she was a professional teacher. Oh, she was a teacher, teacher. Yeah. I see. 
Uh, so it was one fifth of my mother's mother's salary to pay for to someone pay, to come uh, to pay for the child, which apparently doesn't have any talent. <laughs> <laughs> so, so at home there were big debates, and funny thing was that my father, who is an engineer, he was very much for music, and my mother was against <laughs> the idea. By that. So eventually, phone rang, and the director of the school was a very smart man. He said, "You know, we have a wonderful cello teacher." And the cost is only seven rubles per half a year. So when you have 120 rubles per half or seven rubles per half a year. Let's give him the cello. Yeah. So my mother, my, mo my mother was kind of insulted to be honest. <laughs> she thought of me as of, uh, as of a professional concertizing, you know, piano player. And then suddenly cello, you know, orchestral instrument. And Oh, uh, that was no good, orchestral to instrument. To her, it wasn't good enough now. Uh, so the, she said, okay, we'll take a couple of lessons, and if the child likes it, then we'll continue. No? And I remember first lesson very well, as it was, what, almost, it was 25 years ago, quarter of the century ago. And I still remember, as if it would be yesterday. Um, I remember the smell of the instrument when it was brought. They just the brought room. you a cello. Were there just other people in the room? There was my teacher, there was my mother, there was me. Um, but not a lot of students. No, this was no. a private lesson. It's a private lesson, yes, of course, yeah. And later on, my mother would say that it was truly strange because, you know, usually children will have difficulties with positioning arms and everything. Yeah. In my case, there was no difficulties whatsoever. You just picked it up? Yeah, I just picked the instrument and I started playing. And by the end of the first quarter, they uh, realized that I had perfect pitch and wonderful sense of rhythm and everything was good with the uh, memory. Uh, so my parents didn't have to pay anything. So into school you went. <laughs> yeah, but that was a cho that was a choice. The choice was made. I became, you know, a cellist. That is so fabulous, and you've been holding that instrument ever since, right? Yep. You just picked it up. Was it smaller? Yeah, it was a small cello. It was quarter of the size of this is the full size, and the first cello was a quarter of this size. I see, and that's how children learn to play yeah. on smaller pieces. Yeah. Um, and you talked about. The teachers coming in. Who were your teachers then? Well, you know, musicians. When we study instrument, we have the primer mentors, so to speak, those mm -hmm. who actually teach us to play instrument, and additional teachers who teach us theory of music, uh, history of music, and other instruments. I was truly fortunate uh, because in in Baku. Uh, my very first teacher's name was Yelena Zenchenka. Then there was Yuri Abdulayev, who was prominent cellist. They were cellist. very prominent. Yeah. Then when I moved to Moscow, I studied in conservatory with Kirill Rodin. I was fortunate enough to take lessons with Daniel Shafran, Rostropovich, Gutman. And, and so uh, those people would be teaching someone who was very talented, who they could believe in. Yeah. 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 I mean, in Moscow Conservatory, of course, it's, it's probably still is the uh, one of the largest and probably some of the most successful music school in the world. But they call it Tchaikovsky Moder uh Tchaikovsky Moscow Conservatory. That's what they, ca they call yes. it. Yeah. But yeah. it teaches all. All the instruments. Yes. However, my specialization was, uh, my specialty was cello. So I was mostly educated on cello performance and in the other subjects, of course, a little bit too. You know. and, and you had these fantastic teachers, but you then decided to become a master teacher. You were a master teacher at these festivals that you would go to. What did you do? Was it just a short little period and you would give a yeah. workshop? I, I, am, I started teaching when I was 18, wow. professionally. And there was a moment in my life at which I realized I accumulated a certain amount of and quantity and quality of knowledge. Yes, and that's what happens, isn't yes. it? And then there was a moment when you feel that you need to pass it to the next mm -hmm. generation. It's up to the next gen generation what they want to do with it, but uh, th there is a need to be th for the knowledge to be passed. And yeah, I started teaching. Uh, I had a class in Ippolito Ivanov Music Institute in Moscow. I had assistantship in Moscow Conservatory. Oh, you did yeah, right away. Professorship ah. in uh, Croatian Academy of Music. And when I moved to United States, I formed my school. It's Altopolis Academy, and I have a whole bunch of. So excellent. you have a school now? Yeah. And what's the name of it? Altopolis Academy. Altopolis Academy. And yes. where is it? Uh, we have three locations in San Diego, in Fullerton, and in Los Angeles. Fabulous.
fabulous. And yes. then, so you choose the teachers to come? Oh, practically, yes. And, and you oversee it? it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I teach myself also. And oh, Actually, for those who are interested, you can go on my website. It's celloart.com. And there is a list of, you know, some of the most advanced students of mine. And there are their winnings. Within the last seven years, uh, I think they accumulated m close to a hundred winnings of different competitions. That's fabulous. When you think of cello, you think of Yo-Yo Ma, Slava Rostropovich, Pablo Casals. There's a um, there's a sound or some kind of romantic feeling about the cello. Yeah. Is that right? Does that? Well, is this is the closest to human voice music instrument. That's why. Probably. Probably. On one hand, on the other hand, just the actual um, depth of cello sound. Probably. Yes, there's a yeah. quality to it, yeah. isn't there? The depth. You, you uh, are the artistic director of something called Positive Motions. Motions. Tell yes. us a little bit about that. Oh, it's, it's, a, it's, it's a little bit spontaneous enterprise, which started about half a year ago. And it started from the conversation between my piano player and me. She was complaining that, oh, you know, there is so much of negativity in our industry. And she said, you know, I was offered to start a concert series in Glendale. And uh, we started thinking how to name the concert series. Somebody came up with the idea, why don't we call it something positive? Oh, to, instead and of then, negative. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, we came up with a you know, positive motions concept Emotions series. Is motions is... Motions, motions, and the actual you know, motion and emotions in general. Whatever is positive, we want to have on this concert series. We want to deliver positive emotions to the Emotions people. <laughs> too. Where do, you, where do you play? Uh, the concert series is happening at the First Baptist Church of Glendale. Oh, and the acoustics are supposed to be great there. Amazing. This is a, uh, I consider the forgotten jewel of, of Los Angeles, to be honest. That church? Yes. The church has been there for 105 years. Wow. And uh, there's a truly interesting story about it. The, in, in the beginning of the 20th century, when the church was just built, uh, the congregation was huge, so the sanctuary can seat 960 people. Oh. So you can just imagine, beginning of the 20th century, Los Angeles practically did not exist at that That's time. It fantastic. was just starting to build, yes. right? And uh, in Glendale, where it was practically a desert, uh, the church of that size was built. So we can only imagine what, what the congregation was, right? Yeah. And uh, somewhere in the beginning of 20th century also, there appeared a young and very healthy pastor. Pastor lived until 101 years old. He probably was the, the, the oldest acting pastor oh. in California, maybe even in the nation. Well, a know. lot of people were praying for him to <laughs> live a long time. No, <laughs> <laughs> the, but the, the, the thing is that <laughs> he died a few years ago and his successor, found a church uh, with a congregation which shrank to 30 people uh. and 35 pianos in the building. Believe it or not. This is a really fantastic place, isn't it? Is. It? it is. Fantastic acoustic. And uh, the ceiling was collapsing, so the sanctuary was closed for about a year for the restoration, and they finished it uh, a few months ago prior to Christmas. And uh, about a year ago, I was invited uh, to play a small, you know, outreach uh, recital there, like a concert. As soon as I said, and you know, I live in Silver Lake, very close to oh, Glendale. Yes. And I was passing that building often. Oh, you'd driving, seen it before? And I've seen the building before, and I would drive and I think, what is it there inside? Is uh. it a storage of some kind? And the building looks really nice, but it's not in use, obviously. Then suddenly I get an invitation to play performance there. So I said, yes, I'm going. And I, I'm curious to get inside to see <laughs> what it is there inside. Uh, so to my surprise, um, the acoustic abilities of that particular venue, to me, it is a concert hall. <laughs> yeah, it's a concert hall. Uh, yes. Which uh, leads me to the one minute before we have to leave, will you pick up your cello and right finish now. your story? Sure. <laughs> Well, basically, let me, let me finish real quick. So, Positive Motion Concert Series is a foundation now. Uh 
Ah. It is 501c3, and the DBA of that foundation is Glendale Philharmonic Association. Oh, so which is you're a part uh, yes, founder I'm, of that. Yes, oh, I'm that's the founder great. of Glendale Philharmonic, and uh, we are actually very excited. We did the inaugural concert of the uh, orchestra on January 9th. It yes, was sold I, out. Yes, I heard. That's yes, great. Actually, I made a big deal. And you're yes. going to do something by Popper, the composer yes. Popper, who yes. is, you told me, yeah, he, a he, renowned in cello. He lived at the end of 19th, beginning of 20th century. His name was David Popper. He composed a number of pieces for cello. Apparently, Mr. Popper liked to eat very much, but wasn't always to pay, wasn't always ready to uh, prepare to pay for his dinners. Ah, so he played for so his dinners. The restaurators knew that sometimes if Popper would come in the restaurant, would o order a lot of tasty food, he would quickly run home and compose a piece for cello or cello with piano, you know, and bring it back as a payment for the... So. And before <laughs> he starts playing, we'll be right back with June Gable, so don't go away, but we're going to play off with our friend Ruslan Biryakov. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Thank you. <laughs> Welcome back to the Joan Quinn Profiles. I'm here with award-winning actress June Gable, who was born and raised on the East Coast. She earned a Bachelor of Fine Arts at Carnegie, Ellen, uh, Carnegie Mellon University, and June has enjoyed a successful career in the theater for over 40 years. She continues that success with her role in The Broads, which is a musical starring four fantastic women of a certain age. <laughs> she was nominated for a Tony in Candide and also by the London Dramatic uh, Critics for Jacques Brel is Alive and Well. June's had roles in Pump Girls and Dinettes, uh, They're Playing Our Song, Moose Murders, The Lion in Winter, and I guess uh, you're considered a song and dance person. Yeah, it's been kind of varied. Uh, Has it? It's been very interesting because at Carnegie Mellon we were trained in classical theater, but to survive I did musicals and that's how it all happened. Well, did you take music classes? Were you musical in school? Well, we didn't have musical training at Carnegie Mellon when I, when I was training as an actress. We only trained in classical theater and modern theater too. But how, could you, how did you learn to sing? Because all, a lot of these roles that we're talking about have been singing roles or semi-singing roles. I think it was just something that was always sort of latent and there. <laughs> you have a great voice. Thank you. Thank you. I, I, I enjoyed singing. My mother was a singer and she sang oh. to me when I was a little child. And, and then uh, after I started to do musicals, I studied with Felix Knight um, in New York City who helped me to preserve my voice so that in these big eight eight shows a week musicals, I wouldn't lose my voice. Well, I think that's the most important thing, isn't it? Learning to yeah. control your voice. Yeah, and breathing is really important to, to just make sure that your breath is supported more than anything. The, um, the Lion in Winter you played 
Opposite. I played Eleanor, and I played opposite Jason Miller, who was fantastic. One of my very, very dearest and closest friends, and a brilliant writer and actor, and uh, just uh, left us too quickly. And we, we lack his his brilliance in the theater today, don't we? He was yeah. an all-around Renaissance kind of guy. We were um, planning to open a theater in Philadelphia before he died, and um, oh. we were going to do Lion in Winter, which went on and was fabulously successful. And then we were working on Who's Afraid of Virginia Woolf? Oh, the two Edward Albee. The two of us doing this in tandem in rep and unfortunately he got very, very ill and then he passed away. He was away. very young. He was I think he was. He was very young. So tell us about this nomination for Candide. Well, that was quite a while ago, but it was a great experience. And I don't think thing. it ever matters, does it? No. If, you're, if you're nominated for a Tony, it's like forever. Yeah, and I think that um, it's the nomination of your peers. <laughs> it, winning is important in anything, but winning is also sometimes the lottery, whereas being nominated uh, it doesn't make you bitter to lose that. It just makes you feel good that your peers considered you oh, interesting I agree. enough. What was the role? Tell us about the well, role. Well, it was an old woman. I was only about 26, uh, 27 at the time, and I played uh, the old woman in Candide with the one buttock. You know, oh, so. so you did. Oh, yeah. so it really was a great acting job. It was a job. big jump. It was a big <laughs> jump, uh, but uh, I think I've always been a character actress, so it's not. It's not very far away. Well, talking about characters, since you brought it up, Googie Gomez. Yes, I played Googie Gomez in the Ritz. Um, I actually replaced Rita Moreno in the Ritz. So tell us about that character, because she was kind of a well-known uh, Googie Gomez, right? Yeah, Have Terrence heard heard? McNally wrote the play, and he's a great playwright. And uh, it was just a great deal of fun. Um, it, it actually took place in the gay baths. <laughs> it was a very wild. A lot of, lot of different uh, people were in it. F. Murray Abraham and Stubby K. It was just a, a Jack. Uh, well, it was just so many. Uh, Is that right? Yeah, the cast just went on and on and on, the cast list. Jerry Stiller was in it. Um, were they coming in and out, or were yeah, they people all? people came in. It was a long running. They were coming in and out. It was very long. I see. So different people could play the same role, the same characters? Yeah, different people came in at different times, um, um, which I think is going to happen with this uh, current show that I'm into. We're going to talk about broads, because that's about four uh, women who were successful what, actresses. Is that right? Well, actually, they my character is kind of a wannabe, but um, they really weren't professional actresses. They were actually just regular housewives and mothers and um, uh, either some of them are, uh, uh, you know, they're widows and um, they've lost their husbands and they're in this retirement home and, um, was that? yeah, there she, there it is. And, and so the story is they're in the retirement home. They're in the retirement home and they just put on this show and the little complications and the interactions. Um, to me, it's it's um, a very light and amusing, uh, you know, not going to solve world problems, very entertaining show, and it's about aging, and uh, it's great that it's being done in Hollywood <laughs> because <laughs> nobody wants to age in Hollywood. Do you sing and dance? We do. We sing and dance. It's a wonderful cast: uh, Yvonne Cole and Leslie Easterbrook and Barbara uh, Niles and. Uh, the four of us are just having a ball. The audiences are going crazy. Did you ever work professionally together with, with the no. other cast members? Because they're all on, they've been on TV, they've been on stage. We've all done a lot of television comedy. Um, uh, um, Leslie Easterbrook and I go back and we've done a lot of TV comedy together. Uh, not together, but um, separately. And, um, but no, we, we didn't know each other, but uh, yet we play friends for many, many, many years, really old, good friends. And, and in the end, that's really what the piece is about, the friendships and the real, the real love that you, exists. You talked about being a 27-year-old or in your late 20s playing this old person on, in Candide mm -hmm. when you first started on Broadway. Now, how old is this character in Broads? Uh, I would say this character is probably in her late 60s. She could, she could be... I'd say late 60s. Oh, late 60s. <laughs> I'm getting there. She's I'm not getting there. so old. <laughs> I'm getting there. I'm not that far away. <laughs> so, so it's the same kind of thing where you're playing an older person again. Well, I always did. Uh, when I did uh, Friends, the television show. Yeah, let's talk about that. She was a great character. Uh, the character of Estelle, Joey's agent on Friends, and um, she was in her 80s. 
Oh, so, she was. Oh, yeah. She, in fact, she died at the end of the series. <laughs> so that you were the end. That they was called fun. me up one day and they said, "Are you sitting?" And I said, "Yes." And they said, "Well, Estelle died." And for a second, I didn't know who they were talking about until I realized it's my character. Oh. They're telling me my character is. Oh, no. I said, oh, thanks. How sad. What a way to go. What a way to go. She was a heavy smoker. Oh, so she was like, was she, a, she was a toughie, wasn't she? She was very tough. She always smoked. She put the cigarettes out in her coffee and in her bologna sandwiches. And it was, a, it was hilarious. And I had a, of course, my story had most to do with Matt LeBlanc, who played Joey. And I just adored him. He was just sweet from beginning to end, a real human. But that isn't your character, smoking and carrying on like that. You spent time in India. Yes, I did. And you're into yoga. I did. I had a yoga studio in Hollywood for a long time, but but I did smoke. I've had my wild days, and you I did not, was a during, smoker. During that time? I'd say in the 70s was a period where where I, when I was living out here, and I, I, I had my wild days, and I was a smoker. But what happened with that role? With the friends role. Well, it just played its course. It was on the series and but then I mean, at the end. It, and the smoking and being so tough, I mean. Had that, was stopped, that was hard. <laughs> that was hard. Because just, you know, getting those Marlboros and smoking them again and I just well, oh boy, I better I better not like do this too much. It was tough. Yeah. It really was. So, did you always want to be a stage actress or an actress per se? I think since I was a very little girl, I think it, it happened very young. And I don't know why. Maybe I needed a lot of attention. I just think. You know, you've played on stages all over the world. Uh, yeah. What is like Europe versus the U.S. and Broadway versus off-Broadway and large theater versus small? Let's talk. Are there differences, say, yes. in Europe and the United States? Or well, I think um, um, in in Europe, um, for women, it's different. I think I think here it's difficult to get to a certain age, and it's difficult to age on the stage. It's easier, but when you're dealing with oh media and camera, uh, TV. It's a little easier on television film. It's a little harder. And once you sort of hit a certain age, it's, it's difficult. But in Europe, there's a different attitude. Oh, that's, the atti that's the idea. And I think good acting is kind of good acting whether you're on a tiny little, we're in a very intimate oh, stage here at the say, El Portel. Yes, that's why I brought it up, because the El Portel, what is it, the El Portel Forum? It's the El Portel, I, yes, it's, a, it's the small stage, yes. but they have a very large theater for yes. venues like that. Right. But I think, you know, if we're having fun, um, we can be a little bit more intimate, but it's a musical, and so it's, it's bigger it's than big life. It's big to you, yes. the actors, and it's probably big to us. How many seats is it? Uh, under 100, probably. Yeah, I think it's about 100 Nine, seats. 99, probably. Small. They're putting in up new ones. They're, They're putting, putting more. <laughs> but, what, but what about Broadway and off-Broadway? There must be a big difference in that. Yes, I think the difference is in size, um, and depending on how much you have to bring up your performance. Otherwise, you know, I, I, like I say, unless you're, the camera is right here, um, it's stage acting. There is a difference in technique when you act in front of a camera. It's, it's, it's just a, a whole different thing. Well, t talking about technique, too, I think a lot might have to do with your director. Very much so. On both, in, in both situations, you're working with Jules Aaron right now, who is fantastic, isn't he? He's a wonderful, wonderful person and a, and a wonderful director to work with. I've, we've always wanted to do a project together and never have, and so this is... And Kay Cole, who is the choreographer... I was going to ask you. She's fabulous. I don't know her work, but she's been nominated for uh, uh, Tony's and a lot of awards, so she's done a lot of work, I guess. We were in New York together. She was in a chorus line. She was a performer. Oh, she was. She's a wonderful singer and a wonderful performer, wonderful dancer, but she she uh, got married and moved out here with her husband, and um, she's just a fantastic choreographer. She can choreograph dancers who are great, or people like us. We're <laughs> actresses who move. Actresses. Well, that's the thing, is moving your actresses around, right? I mean, Jules has to do it, the director. But when you when you're it's a song and dance thing, the choreographer also has to be able to do that. The they work in tandem, yeah. so they work together really beautifully. In fact, they've done many many shows together. And so. how have you been training for this? 
Well, I'm huffing and puffing a little bit. I, I used to run uh, six or seven miles. I don't do that anymore. <laughs> um, but uh, I think basically you're breathing, like I say, and, um, you know, a nice aerobic walk and, and uh, yoga stretches and um, little things that I do for myself that I've compiled over the years. And, and what, what about the acting part of it? Is anything different in that? Um, the drama of it. Well, the, my character in musical theater, there is, I think, less, sometimes, less of a dramatic arc. Yeah, that's... But my character does have her moment, you know, at the end of the show, where she realizes that her marriage may have been less than perfect due to her own problems as a person. And she actually takes a good look at herself. She's so defensive and she offends people. And then sort of like she, she, she looks at herself at the end of the play. So that's a nice, it's a nice beginning, middle, and end for a character in a musical. It's not just um, superficial. It's well, like I can't wait to see it. Broads at the El Portel. Yes. And June Gable, you've been a delight to have. Thank you so much for being with us. Well, thank you for having me, and I'm so happy to be in L.A. Oh, we're glad to have <laughs> happy. you. And talking about L.A., keep writing to 777 South Figueroa, 44th floor, Los Angeles 90017. And be sure to email at J-A-Q-U-I-N-N, -N, the numeral one, at AOL.com. And we'll see you next time on the Joan Quinn Profiles.